Good morning, everybody. We're all very happy to be here. I'm Ann Hyde, and I'm a professor in the history department. And I am delighted to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Catherine Benton Cohen. She's an old friend of mine. Um, we share a first job at Louisiana State University, so we share that experience, but we're also Western historians. She is a professor at Georgetown University. She got her PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her BA degree from Princeton. She's an Arizona native, and she's the author of two books, both from Harvard University Press. The most recent book is called Inventing the Immigration Problem, The Dillingham Commission and Its Legacy and she'll be taught, giving us a good historical overview of this issue. She's also served as the historical advisor to the nonfiction feature film, Bisbee 17. She's had research fellowships and awards from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars, and she and her work have appeared in a variety of media outlets, including PBS American Experience, the BBC, Descent. She also serves as the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecture Series, um, and her current research is about the global history of the Phelps Dodge family. So I'm delighted to welcome her to our stage here in the University of Oklahoma, and um, well, please welcome Professor Benton Cohen. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, it's really an honor uh, to start off. Uh, well, I thought it was an honor to, to start this day, and I found out it was alphabetical. Uh, so um, thank you to my grandfather, who changed our family last name from Zabinden, which starts with a Z, to Benton, which starts with a B. Uh, OK, it, but it is an honor to be here. And I really want to thank the organizers for inviting me, especially Dean David Robel, Professor Justin Wirt, and the amazing behind-the-scene organizer, Helen Green, who I've invited to organize my whole life because she did such a nice job here. Um, and also to my old friend Ann Hyde for the introduction and also to Coffee. Okay, um, without which I could not be here this morning. Let me turn though to the topic at hand because it is one of vital importance. What I hope to do briefly this morning is to tell you a bit about the historical context of our current immigration situation I hope I can give you some brief sense of the history of immigration laws and restrictions in the United States, and I'll conclude with a couple bullet points on the parallels and differences with today, as well as some of the hot button issues that have recently emerged. Although none of them are particularly new, they certainly have new permutations. So today I want to give you a, a small sense, a brief sense of how we got from there to here and what legacies remain in our immigration policy from what we might call its formative era from the 1880s to 1924. I'll talk about the laws that created the first numerical or quantitative restrictions on immigration in 1917, 21, and 24. And as I mentioned, I'll gesture towards some current issues that I suspect will be the fodder for some of your questions. Uh, and I hope to leave uh, plenty of time for those questions. Now I want to begin, I'm the first using this, so um, I'm going to hope I'm doing it right. There, I did it. Okay. I want to begin um, with the story of Anna Herkner. This is Anna. Herkner uh, grew up in the Bohemian, not counterculture, Czech, uh, <laughs> the Czech settlement of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Who knew? She went on to get a degree at UC Berkeley and graduated in the early 20th century, about 1904, and she graduated with a degree in Slavic literatures. After that, she got a job working at a settlement house in a Polish neighborhood in Baltimore using her Slavic language skills. And this picture is when she was employed by the Dillingham Commission, uh, which will be the subject of my talk today, um, and was the largest study of immigrants ever conducted uh, and was convened from 1907 to 1911. So Anna Herkner was the director of a study on steamship conditions, the, the conditions of steerage class passengers um, on transatlantic travels to the United States. As you can see here, along with several of her staff, she actually dressed up 
as a European peasant and took multiple transatlantic journeys in the steerage section. She chronicled harrowing journeys rife with disgusting conditions and what we would understand in the Me Too era to be rampant sexual assault and harassment, much of it by the crews of those ships. The Dillingham Commission's work, of which Herkner was a part, is, as I just mentioned, the subject of my most recent book, and I'll return to it shortly. But one reason why I wanted to open with Anna Herkner um, is that in this year, which happens to be the centennial of the 19th Amendment, right, and women's suffrage, uh, national women's suffrage, at least for white women, I have to take the time to add that Herkner went on to join the National Women's Party after her involvement in the Dillingham Commission and was among the women who was arrested for picketing Pre President Woodrow Wilson's White House in 1917. So she's a timely figure to be reminded of. All right, so to return to our topic, with regard to immigration policy, there are some pretty big differences between a century ago and today. Let me mention a few. One of the biggest is that there was basically no such thing as what some people today call illegal immigrants. Indeed, in the modern sense of the term, this category basically did not exist, except as applied to Chinese immigrants, almost all of whom had been excluded by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Besides this and a related ban on Japanese laborers in 1907, there were no, <clears throat> excuse me, numerical or categorical limits on immigration before the literacy test of 1917. I'll explain a little bit about this in a second. Now, uh, let me give you an example. This is uh, Google Ngram, by the way, which is something that you can um, Google. You know, Google runs everything that Amazon doesn't run. Um, this is where you can actually type in terms, and it will um, search all of the digitized books that Google has and find those terms. And it's a lot of fun to play with. But you can see the way in which this concept and term is really a, a, a post, is a late, relatively late 20th century invention. Okay, so going back to my point about this period, here is an example of the kinds of grassroots organizing, um, uh, particularly around the Irish working class in the American West who campaigned for Chinese exclusion to give you a sense of the, the initial kinds of uh, watershed changes in immigration law um, starting in 1882, and yet they did remain limited. Relevantly, in this particular moment in 2020, as my son's school is closed because of a coronavirus case, there were a growing number of restrictions based on physical and mental health, which give us some insight into who were considered desirable immigrants. In fact, the origins of the uniformed officers of the US Public Health Service was in the officers who worked at Ellis Island. And my colleague, Professor Alan Kraut, who will speak later, is an expert on this topic, so I won't say anything more about it. Nevertheless, long before there were numerical restrictions on immigrants, there were a series of laws about health, which spurred fears of an immigrant menace of disease. Um, so, for example, the first federal immigration law banned, and these are its terms, idiots and lunatics. Um, and again, if you have more questions about this, ask Professor Kraut, who's talking on something different but knows he literally wrote the book on it. So um, that's an opportunity for later. In any case, while some of these restrictions against immigrants seemed cruel or even ridiculous, in practice they barred very few people. Something like 97 to 98 percent of arrivals at Ellis Island passed inspection. And this was partly because the um, boat companies examined people before embarking because they had to pay for return passage. So this was a good way of outsourcing inspection of immigrants to private companies because they wanted to make sure that the people that they brought to U.S. shores passed muster. Even more restrictions were coming, and those are the ones I want to talk about. So to recap, though, here are some of the big differences between then and now. There was almost no such thing as a quote-unquote illegal alien until the mid-20th century. There wasn't even a border patrol. It was not created until 1924. Now, to put this into perspective, my own grandmother was a married woman having her first child by 1924. My gr grandfather on the other side was born to an immigrant family in a border town in Arizona 
11 years before the Border Patrol was created. And I will note, I'm not that old. Their numbers, uh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped ahead here because I got very focused on the I'm not that old part. <clears throat> to reiterate, I'm not that old. Anyway, uh, the, Mexicans, the Mexicans were a very small percentage of the total immigrant population in the United States in the early 20th century. Their numbers were certainly beginning to tick upward sharply after the Mexican Revolution in 1910, and we would call that initial surge refugees, although that did not yet exist as a legal category in the United States. I would also add that the only thing that resembled the precursor to a border patrol were actually a, a, a small group in the initial years, just a few dozen of people that were known as Chinese inspectors who uh, rode the entire 1,200 mile plus border on horseback looking for um, Chinese immigrants who were smuggling themselves from Mexico and Canada to the United States after they were barred from entry in 1882. I bring those up because it shows you a different sensibility about the immigrants on which Americans and policymakers were focused. But I want to switch gears now to talk about uh, those from Eastern and Southern Europe. While my first book was about the history of race at the Arizona-Mexico border, and feel free to ask about it, my more recent book, which Professor Hyde mentioned, Inventing the Immigration Problem, um, <clears throat> Uh, is about the largest study of immigrants ever conducted in the United States. The U.S. Immigration Commission was its official title, but it was known as the Dillingham Commission for its chair, um, Senator Dillingham of Vermont. Uh, this joint congressional commission, you can see, was very diverse. That was a joke. It was diverse in that it had three members of Congress, three members of the Senate, and three experts appointed by President Theodore Roosevelt. From 1907 to 1910, the commission and its staff, it had a staff of more than 300, one of them was Anna Herkner. They visited or gathered data on all 46 states and several territories. Well, part of the time there was 45 states, right, I say, in the great state of Oklahoma, uh, including Hawaii. Because what's the point of having a um, you know, government commission if you can't have a boondoggle to Hawaii? By its conclusion, <clears throat> the Dillingham Commission, which had been given, and this is a quote, no limit on the time or the expense it may incur, unquote, had spent nearly a million dollars, which was an enormous figure for federal expenditure in 1911. In that four years, its staff of about 360, which incidentally, sorry, it was a little bit less than 360, a majority of its staff were women. And although many people have studied the commission, I was the first to notice this. You might think about why that is. Anyway, uh, and not only did women work for the commission, but several, like Anna Herkner, actually chaired um, one of the studies and authored reports. They wrote 41 sets of reports. Aren't you glad that you're just getting the 20-minute uh, review? And a potent set of recommendations that shaped immigration policy for generations to come. The final reports had about 29,000 pages. And the full breadth of them boggled the mind, both in page numbers as well as the breadth of geography and topics that sprawled the full reaches of the progressive era mind. Twenty reports on immigrants in American industries were thick with numbing and undigested tabulations. You can take my word for that. Various reports considered everything from the head size of new immigrants, a famous study done by the already famous Columbia anthropologist Franz Boas, they studied Anna Herkner's conditions on transatlantic travel, prostitution, what was then called white slavery, what we would understand to be sex trafficking. Um, that was a report written by the first woman lawyer in New Jersey, and everyone that worked on that report was anonymous because they were afraid of retaliation from organized crime. They studied debt peonage, crime, schools, agriculture, philanthropic societies, other countries' immigration laws to compare them to ours, and immigrant women's fecundity because, of course, many people in the early 20th century were concerned that immigrant women had higher birth rates than native-born white women. This is what Theodore Roosevelt infamously called race suicide and is one of the reasons he had six kids. Reformers in the progressive era advocated and often deployed federal power um, 
by using surveillance, regulation, interstate policing in new ways, and broad powers of deportation to empower the government's ability to exclude immigrants. That was a big mouthful, but I hope you see that those were important antecedents to the expansion of federal power in the realm of immigration policy today. And so I argue that not only, and I'll say more about this in a second, not only did the power of immigration enforcement by the federal government expand in important ways in this time period of the early 20th century, but I believe it set a precedent for, a precedent for other kinds of expansion of federal power. And so even those people, and I can't imagine who that would be, who might not be interested in immigration policy per se, ought to be interested in it as a kind of harbinger of other kinds of federal power. So that brings me to how this matters today. First, of course, is the similarity of that era to ours. As you may know, 1907 was smack dab in the middle of the era of mass immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe, which means that the grandparents and great-grandparents of people my age who are, for example, of Italian or Eastern European Jewish descent, as I am, are almost all the same generation. At the same time, these people who were known, I'm sorry, at the same time, these folks were known as new immigrants as opposed to the old immigrants from Germany and Ireland. So um, historians, we're not very hip with the lingo. So we call people from Eastern and Southern Europe from 1880 to 1924 new immigrants, even though, of course, they're not new. And that nomenclature was actually cemented by the Dillingham Commission reports, which divided that that group from 1880 to 1924 who were largely Eastern and Southern European from what it called the old immigrants. In those years, somewhere around 24 million immigrants came to the United States. They eventually reached almost 15% of the population, a percentage we have come close to but have not exceeded in the last decade, mostly because of the 2009 um, Recession. I'll be honest, I, I shuffled around my slides a little, so I might be a little off. Hold on, let me make sure I find the right thing here. No, 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 no. See? Maybe I won't show that slide. Maybe it's gone. Uh, yes, here we go. Sorry, it is a little out of order. All right. So one major way that 1920 or 1917, let's back up, differed from today was that in the so-called progressive era, a growing number of Americans viewed government policy and social reform with optimism and enthusiasm, not cynicism and disdain. <clears throat> this seems downright quaint to us today. They looked to the brand new disciplines of social science, economics in particular, to get answers to what they saw as social problems. And that brings me to the recommendations that the Dillingham Commission made. What is amazing and no doubt a record for a government commission is the fact that almost all of its recommendations were implemented in the next decade or so. Uh, I warned you I was going to go backwards. Uh, sorry, I switched these up and I... Let's just stay there. Sorry about that. Okay. The commission's chief recommendation was a literacy test for immigrants along with a continued ban on Asian immigrants, additional regulations and head taxes for entry, and, and this is the money part, for the first time, actual numerical limits on immigration. The literacy test was enacted in 1917. By the way, the literacy test is interesting to us today because the literacy test, which was designed to lower the number of people coming to the United States with the assumption that poor Eastern and Southern European countries had lower literacy rates, was not as draconian as it might seem to us today because you only had to be literate in your native language. And they included Yiddish for Eastern European Jews. But the most important in the long-term recommendation of the Dillingham Commission was the recommendation that some kind of numerical quota be implemented uh, um, uh, in the immigration system. There had never been a numerical limit on immigration prior to this time. And the National Origins Quota System, which was the eventual product of this recommendation, openly discriminated against Southern and Eastern Europeans. 
It did so by using a formula that created national quotas based on the proportion of immigrants from each country in the 1890 census. Okay, here's what I mean by that. In 1890, not very many Southern and Eastern Europeans had yet immigrated to the United States. By using that as a basis of a formula, whereby 2% each year had a quota of 2% of the people of national origin in that 1890 census. The effect was, if you're not following my math, just stay with me, the effect was that the quotas for people from Southern and Eastern Europe were very small, and the quotas for people from Western and Northern Europe were very large. So not only was that openly discriminatory without actually naming the countries in legislation, but it also was a major change in immigration flows because by that time, 80% of immigration came from Southern and Eastern Europe. So it drastically reversed the sources of immigration by 1924. These recommendations, even as suggestions, and especially once they were enacted, signaled a watershed change because they represented the first time that immigration policy was based on quantitative measures, a quota, rather than qualitative me measures like race, criminal status, disease, or radical political beliefs. Or as people at the time said, these were the first laws that were restrictive rather than regulatory. And in my book, I argue that this climate was made possible because of an equation that looks like this. That's one of their thing. I'll come back to that. The Dillingham Commission released its recommendations in 1911, and then the Red Scare and concern about radicalism in the World War I period, joined by the rise in popularity of the science, and I, and I say science because people considered eugenics a science at the time, uh, of, of eugenics theory that increasingly um, cast um, people from Eastern and Southern Europe as racially inferior, that these together helped yield the immigration restriction laws, particularly the quota law of 1924. Now, fast forward 40 years. In the years after World War II, as the horrors of the Holocaust became clear, these laws were increasingly an embarrassment. First President Truman, then John F. Kennedy, and finally LBJ worked to get rid of these quotas along with allies in Congress. The famous Hart-Celler Act, or Immigration and Nationality Act, passed in 1965. It was and is often considered part of the set of civil rights laws that LBJ signed into law. And it was the long-fought victory of those who hoped to get rid of the discriminatory national origins quota. So instead, the Hart-Celler Act gave every nation the same quota. Now that seems like parody, but it's a perfect example of the difference between equality and equity. Why should Mexico, our next-door neighbor, receive the same quota as Switzerland, uh, for example, right? Changing a law overnight, making a quota that is not proportional to the size of an origin country's population or that acknowledges our historical or geographical relationship to a country doesn't make any sense on the ground, even if it looks good in the law that every country has the same quota. Moreover, and again, telling us the ways in which this moment, I'm sorry, the early 20th century was different than today, is that believe it or not, those quotas from 1924 did not include quotas for Latin America. The Western Hemisphere did not have quotas. There was no quota on Mexican immigration in the 1924 law. Think what a contrast in interest that reflected over what kinds of concerns about which peoples the federal government had. And I'll go to this slide, which was a form that the hundreds of employees uh, of the Dillingham Commission would ask people to fill out. So um, they had questionnaires that had as many as 160 questions for immigrants on them. And you can think about how invasive that would be to have a federal agent ask you those questions. Here's one of the shorter ones, but I want you to notice the race categories that they include on the list. And if we had more time, I'd do a Q&A. You can ask me about it later. But I want to I want to point out a couple things to you. One, American is just white or Negro. And two, Mexican is not even on this list. Magyar, yes. Lithuanian, yes. French-Canadian, yes. But no Mexicans. Okay, 
1924, policymakers were interested in curbing uh, Asian and Eastern and Southern European immigration, but they barely noticed immigration from Latin America. In fact, the United States government did not even count, did not even keep tally of land-crossing migrants until 1908. And recall that the Border Patrol was created in the year of the quotas. All right, but let me return to this issue of the quotas. Why are any of these suggestions or laws surprising? Of course you say, of course we regulate immigration. We could do a better job of it, but it seems normal to have immigration laws. That's what the federal government does. Otherwise, immigration is a problem. That's actually one of the things that I wanted to investigate in this book, because that is one of the jobs of the historian, to say, really? Did we normalize something that actually had origins in a particular moment of time and once might have seemed strange? The short answer in this case, as you might have guessed I would say, is yes. I argue that the Dillingham Commission's work and recommendations helped bring about something that now seems like common sense but was in fact then quite a new idea. That immigration is a problem, this was their idea, that the federal government must solve. Now that sounds maybe matter of fact to you now, but in fact, before the progressive era of the early 20th century, it was not clear to most people that either of these, either parts of this supposition was true, that immigration was a problem, or even that if it was, it was necessarily the federal government's to solve. People talked about the immigration question, but restrictions on immigration were almost nil. Even at the height of the anti-Irish nativism of the mid-19th century, to use one of the most famous examples, right? So my students at Georgetown, many of them are Irish Catholic. They all know again about anti-Irish discrimination. Guess what? That's a famous example in American history we often point to. No federal laws in response. There were some state laws, no federal laws. Why is that? Because guess what? In the 1850s, Congress was not excited about expanding federal power. It turns out the Southerners weren't too jazzed about any kind of precedent for expansion of federal power. In 1882, as I mentioned, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was a terrible law. It was the first to restrict immigrants on the basis of class and race. But at least in my view, it was so specifically targeted to one group of people who were among the most reviled in the United States that it's not clear it set any precedent for expansion of other federal laws. And in general, as I've suggested, Americans were very skeptical about federal power in the 19th century, especially in the years following Reconstruction. Here's something else. In the history of immigration policy, the United States has generally had um, a tendency in which Congress has favored legislative approaches to immigration policy because Congress, after all, enacts laws, while presidents have favored the executive power to be flexible with immigration policy. Individual members of Congress are necessarily, in some ways, parochial, right, because they are looking at domestic demands in their home districts where it is not uncommon for their local constituents to consider immigrants uh, an economic or social threat and call for restriction, while presidents, until recently, regardless of party, have often been, in practice, friendlier to immigrants, partly because immigrants, naturalized immigrants and their children make up a large part of the electorate, but equally important for diplomatic reasons. Presidents don't want to go face other heads of state and, sh and, and be hostile to those folks' um, countrymen. And so this has been true, again, until recently, regardless of the party of the president. North, uh, and I want to note here that President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama's stances on immigration reform, at least before 9-11 when Bush changed his policies, actually had a remarkable amount in common. Diplomacy and foreign policy have always been at the center of immigration debates but those have tended to dominate the executive branch's decisions, not Congress's. So it's important to note what an outlier President Trump is in this regard, as in so many things, in being such a hardliner in immigration policy. Presidents from Lincoln to Cleveland to Taft to Wilson to Truman to JFK to Ronald Reagan all spoke and acted in favor of immigration and immigrants in one way or another. Presidents Cleveland, Taft, and Wilson, Wilson twice, 
all vetoed versions of the literacy test precisely because they were concerned about the message that it would send about uh, whether the United States was welcoming to immigrants. And I, need, I, I hardly need to say that these were men of, quite, uh, of two different parties and quite different political sensibilities. All right, so, so what happened? What changed? One of the things I argue in inventing the immigration problem is that the Dillingham Commission had a long-term effect not just on immigration policy, but on how Americans have come to think about federal power in general. Right after the reports were done, the Commission's two most important economists, these guys, Jeremiah Jenks and Jet Locke, published a summary for popular audiences who didn't want to read the 41 volumes, a one-volume summary called The Immigration Problem. And that name, I think, sums up the sensibility of progressive era social scientists, that they describe what they found a problem, right? And the problem was that immigrants were undermining the American standard of living and the solution was new federal tools of immigration regulation and restriction. I argue that the Dillingham Commission's progressive era formulation of an immigration problem in need of solving with federal bureaucratic power has become so indelibly printed, imprinted into our understanding of the federal government that this logic that there's an immigration problem and there must be a federal government solution now seems entirely natural across almost the entire political spectrum, even if we disagree about numbers and flows and so on. The structural factors that were a product of the 1924 quota laws are evident in our immigration um, flows today. Creating a quota for Mexicans in 1965 didn't change the historical realities of migration patterns, which in many ways were a product of the restriction on Eastern Euro and Southern Europeans after 1924. So we see um, uh, immigration from Mexico rise significantly after 1924 and until 1965 to fill that gap and it continues today. Now I've given you um, a lot of information here and I want to suggest to you that merely overnight the changing of law created undocumented immigration where legal migration flows had once existed, right? That the patterns didn't change, the laws changed. Um, I also just want to point really briefly, and how much time do I have? Because there's not a clock up here of any kind. What? It's 10 o'clock. OK. Um, I will wrap up very shortly. I just want to point to, and you can ask me questions, all of these recent issues, this issue of the likely to become a public charge rule relates to the uh, Immigration Act of 1882. Refugee law is a product of separating immigration law and refugee law in the latter part of the 20th century. Let's think of um, some of uh, my ancestors, Eastern European Jews, we might understand them to be refugees today. They did not come in as refugees because there were no quotas. They could come in as regular immigrants. Family separation and child detention is a really critical one for us to consider, and here's why. With the exception of um, Asian exclusion, which often did separate families, the history of immigration uh, regulation in this country has not included child separation on any large scale. In fact, many, many immigration agents worked at great length, both at Ellis Island and at border stations, to keep families reunited, including overturning decisions in which some family member was excluded. So we see cases where somebody had a disability, somebody was considered likely to become a public charge, but in fact a supervisor would overturn that decision to keep families together. And I feel it's critical to point out that that is a new development. It is not one that has a strong tradition in, in federal policy. The issue of DACA really gets to this question of federal power and who wields it in immigration policy in important ways. And I want to remind you um, that historians are supposed to have empathy. This is actually one of our core values of our professional association, that we are supposed to practice empathy. Okay, so the last thing that I want to say here, I've just highlighted those bullet points as I promised to, 
is I want to return to my point about the consequences of expanding federal power by way of immigration policy. Consider, for example, the irony of President Donald Trump's then advisor Stephen Bannon in 2017 in the same interview called for a deconstruction of the administrative state even as he advocated a dramatic expansion of federal immigration enforcement and exclusion. That should be paradoxical, but the way in which immigration enforcement at any level to no limits has become naturalized in this sensibility I think is reflected in those two remarks in the same conversation. But conceiving of immigration as a policy problem in the United States was an invention of the progressive era mind and sensibility, and one deeply embedded in the way that both bureaucrats and elites saw the relationship between social science and public policy in the progressive era. The irony is that in many, many ways in the supposedly post-fact world we inhabit, we've long since left our confidence and experts and social science behind and yet we live with the residue of their misguided confidence in immigration policy. I thank you and I look forward to your questions. While Professor Hyde's coming up here, I'm going to just go to a, a last couple slides. Um, this is the uh, border wall um, that I took of this picture in 2013. I'm sure you'll see other pictures of walls. Uh, a couple of my ancestors helped found this cemetery of Eastern European Jews who immigrated to the U.S.-Mexico border, and you'll notice this was taken in about 2018. The wall is behind there. So I want to tell you that the stories we think are separate are really connected. Thank you, Professor Benton Cohen. I want to open the, the floor for questions. Um, there are students out there who have microphones, so wait until someone shows up with a microphone so everyone can hear your question. So there's someone right there. And can you introduce yourself? I always like to know who I'm talking to. My name is Charlie Canny. I'm in the political science department. And I have uh, two points I'd like you to comment on. One is simply that um, it, it might be understood from what you said that there was no immigration problem perceived in the United States before the 1880s. And I don't think that's what you meant to say. Okay. Uh, but that's how it came across. And so if you could comment on the idea that, the, um, that anti-immigrant fear, a uh, fear of immigrants and anti-immigrant sentiment is part of the texture of the United States uh, since before the founding. Um, you, you're familiar with the fa famous 1753 letter of Benjamin Franklin right. denouncing the immigration of Germans as destroying our national culture. And we know that political parties and other political movements were organized around anti-immigrant sentiment long before the 1880s. So that would be one point. The other point about the federalization um, with the impasse in terms of uh, immigration reform, that there has really been nothing that the federal government has been able to do for many years, there was a wave of state-level yes. reforms, highly restrictive in character. So it kind of seemed like it reverted to the pre-1880s in some way. And I just wondered if you could comment on that as well. Thank you. Great questions. Um, so the first thing is, this is an interesting thing, and I, I hope you'll ask the same question really of everyone today, because... I think historians all agree that there is a history of nativism in this country, but I think we differ in what we think that means, right? So um, Professor Crowd and I have a colleague in Washington, Tyler Anbinder, who has done some really interesting work on this question, and he wrote a piece for the Washington Post where he said there's been five... I'm not going to remember what all five they are. I've been embarrassed before by being asked this, but he, he gave five criteria of... of nativism that presidents have expressed in one way or another. And he said only President Trump has exhibited all five. That's, we're all like, he's distinctive in some way, and we all have different ways that we say it, and that was his, okay? But what I mean by this is that I think it's really significant 
that while there have, of course, always been waves of nativism, the consequences have changed dramatically with changing ideas about the power of the state on the state level and the federal level to do something about it. Do you see what I mean? So that's actually one reason why I think this early 20th century and the Dillingham Commission, the, the way in which, these were basically like the first federal experts, right? This guy, Je uh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah Jenks, who was the lead economist on the um, Dillingham Commission, um, historians of social science consider him the first federal expert. He started being appointed to commissions and whatnot by Theodore Roosevelt back in New York. And so I think once, this isn't a word I want to use, how do I say this? Um, once federal expansion of federal power into the immigration bureaucracy became um, one way to address nativism, then it becomes, in my view, okay, I will use it, much more weaponized. Um, because at the end of the day, while there were nasty nativists before, they didn't accomplish a whole lot on a macro level. So that's my take. There are ranges of opinions on this question of the history of nativism. I mean, Ben Franklin did not stop Germans from coming to Pennsylvania. Right? I mean, he could rant all he wanted, but that wasn't the consequence. Same with the know-nothings in the 1850s. There's still a lot of Irish Americans, you know? Um, uh, with respect to the second question, yes, there's a lot of interesting work, and I suspect some of the subsequent speakers will talk about this. And I'm from Arizona, and my book on Arizona and the border came out minutes before SB 1070 was passed. Uh, which was weird because people said, oh, you're so lucky that your book came out at such a good time. And I was like, that's a really sick way of looking at it because I'm not in favor of SB 1070 and I don't want to uh, uh, have this be that moment. But um, yeah, as you may know, um, you know, liberals today, these are terms that don't translate over time very well, but the left um, has wanted, you know, and many people, moderates have wanted comprehensive immigration reform for a long time on the federal level and bemoaned with good reason uh, Arizona's SB 1070 and its copycats in places like Mississippi and Alabama and so on, North Carolina. But uh, now uh, many people are looking to the states, particularly California is one example, I think Illinois, for creative state level solutions. And there is a wonderful historiography. There's a relatively um, new book by a great young historian named Hidetaka Hirota about the state origins of many of the early federal policies, which were very much modeled on laws in um, Massachusetts and New York that were designed, many of them were public health laws, were designed to limit Irish Americans from coming ashore uh, in the United States or quarantining them and so on. Um, so yes, there's been a, well, maybe federalism will be useful to us now turn um, among some um, progressives who felt that, um, you know, who don't see immigration reform happening anytime soon. So thank you for bringing those to our attention. You have to wait for a mic. She's she, here. It comes. I see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. My name is Artie Fagan. I'm a graduate of the law school here, an undergraduate. Uh, my parents, um, grand, my grandparents were came were Jewish came from Eastern Europe and I'm wondering they had great difficulty my grandparents when they were in New York Brooklyn Delancey Street where all the Jews were and many of them at that time but when they came west and they came west things were very different and they were very successful I wonder if that experience is fairly common as compared to the eastern United mm -hmm. States to the west during the late 1800s and early 1900s? Yeah, so I thank you for that question because I can't help but give a slightly uh, genealogical answer that my ancestors can't, you know, this looks pretty crowded. This, not so much. Uh, this is where my Eastern European Jewish ancestors came and, um, you know, when I was growing up, my mother grew up in El Paso and I thought everyone in El Paso was Jewish or Mexican. It turns out that's not true, uh, but that was my perspective. Um, and, um, my point is that, yes, there's lots of studies that, in fact, Jews who went to the West and South found significantly less anti-Semitism. They were sort of white in ways that were a little bit more difficult to achieve. They faced a lot less uh, redlining, uh, social exclusions like country clubs and so on. Um, 
Greenwood, Mississippi had a Jewish mayor. Tombstone, Arizona had a Jewish mayor. Um, and just one more thing, I didn't mention it because it was a sidebar and it didn't work. But one of the things that the Dillingham Commission was super interested in doing was it created basically a, a bureau, they called it Bureau of Information, which sounds a little creepy, but it was actually just a publicity bureau to encourage new immigrants to distribute themselves to the West and the South and the Midwest. They did not think these immigrants were, in, were um, racially inferior, unlike the later eugenicists. In fact, they thought, you know, if you would just move to Texas, if you would just move to Iowa, we could, we could alleviate people's concerns about urban overcrowding and assimilate you a little bit better. So y you are right that that reflected a certain kind of sensibility. The numbers weren't large enough to make a difference, but it did happen. Maybe one more question? Keep going. Raise your hand again, ma'am. There you go. Do you want to hold it or do you want me to hold it? Oh, you want to hold it. Okay. Um, I just, you talked a lot about immigration restrictions. Can you speak a little about the incredible opening, wasn't it, in the 60s? Yes. Of immigrants into the United States that has somehow fueled this thinking among people who are friends of President Trump's. Uh, I can. I bet other people are going to say more about this, but it is certainly true that the reforms of 1965, oh, I just unglued something that was supposed to stay there. Sorry. Um, the reforms of 1965, in part because they included family reunification, expanded the numbers of immigrants in ways that supposedly surprised the writers of the legislation, but more important, I think, with regard to this history of nativism, they dramatically shifted where immigrants were coming from to the United States. So that's when we see a drastic expansion in immigration from Latin America and from Asia and to some extent from Africa, and that surprised and alarmed many people with a kind of racial nativism that's one of the brands of nativism. Um, but it's a good question, and I suspect other people are going to say more about it. And since I'm getting a 60-second mark, I think maybe we'll take, we'll let Anne uh, close us up here. So thank you very thank, much. Let's, let's thank Professor Benton Cohen.